All right, guys, I got a kick out of this video here that I wanted to share with you. So um, this is on MSNBC. Th this is to show you what your, uh, you know, your, your aunt and uh, your older sister and your, your uh, scarf-wearing <laughs> buddy. This is to show you what, they're, what they uh, are listening to on a daily basis if they're tuning into MSNBC. So th thank you, Case Study QB, for dropping this video for us. But they're going to talk con compare the MAGA squad, as they call it, to the squad. Like the, you know, AOC, Cory Bush, etc. Anyway, let's listen to this. This is this is something. Of June, you published uh, a very prescient article about the MAGA squad and their growing influence over the GOP, writing how they're, quote, uh, spent the past year building their power and now they're preparing to wield it. If McCarthy or any other Republican wants to be speaker, he's going to have to go through them. And he's not. Let me just say, even the framing of calling Bobert uh, Gates and the rest of them, the 19 that held out, even calling them the MAGA squad is not an accurate depiction of what happened because McCarthy voted 97% of the time with Trump. Gates voted 85% of the time with Trump and Trump backed McCarthy from the very beginning. So like these people, they don't care about accuracy, right? Like it's all just perception and they just run with it. And it's, I don't know, that really gets under my skin because it just gives people a misleading picture of the nature of this fight. And if they misunderstand that, they're going to misunderstand other things, and they just don't really understand this fight on the Republican side. So anyway, let's continue. Not getting their votes without meeting their demands, so you wrote. Now that we've seen, well, that's what happened, um, what might be next for the MAGA squad and its grip over the GOP, you sort of intimated what was possibly going to happen in the future in that we're going to go through the same debate about who is going to be their leader. Yeah, well, and, you know, I think what we saw over the past week was that uh, they, they were saying these things out in the open, members like Matt Gates, but Kevin McCarthy really either wasn't taking them seriously or didn't think he was going to need their votes. And what we saw play out is that he needs to take seriously uh, their demands and that they really have been studying uh, the, the procedural rules and all of these things so that they are ready to exert their leverage. You know, they were studying the, the, the squad of the left. They were studying all of the tactics and procedures. Procedures, and we saw them put that, those to work over the past week's worth of votes, and they're ready to keep doing this. So Kevin McCarthy is going to be operating with a sort of sort of Damocles hanging over his head, whether it's in the form of that one-member motion to vacate that the holdout secured, or whether it's all of these other uh, concessions. Uh, they are going to be using those to, as they put it, enforce the terms of the agreement. I sincerely don't know how anybody's analysis could be that disconnected from reality. They've been studying the squad of the left, this this new right-wing faction. Okay, no, 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 no. You have no idea what you're talking about. So I, I can explain it because I was directly involved with a lot of this stuff. So the idea of Justice Democrats when it was founded is the original name for it, a lot of people don't know this, is Tea Party of the Left. That was the original name for it. Why? Because we wanted a left faction that copied the tactics of the Tea Party that fought tooth and nail like rabid dogs. Now, that was never public, that like, oh, you know, it was Tea Party of the left or whatever, because eventually we settled on Justice Democrats, right? But um, the idea was take this new group of outsider Democrats who get elected, many of them did get elected, and then have them form a group and throw their weight around and make demands and shift the Overton window and um, hopefully win some victories for the American people by using the tactics of the Tea Party, the sort of, um, you know, I don't want to use the word destructive because that has a negative connotation. And I was going to say slash and burn, but I don't even know if that's an actual phrase or if I just made that up right now. <laughs> use the sort of blitzkrieg tactics. Oh, that has some negative <laughs> connotations as well. Use these aggressive tactics where it's like, we're not playing ball. We're outsiders. We're not insiders. So we're going to harness the power that we have, the power of the people, and like use that to force change. Now, what actually happened when these Justice Democrats got to D.C.? I, and look, there's a steel man case for them, and then there, there's like a charitable and an uncharitable case for them. I'll give you both, okay? The charitable case for them is they saw the way Washington worked, and they thought the only way we're going to get any change is to play the game to some extent. So got to like bend the knee to Pelosi, got to, you know, make nice with leadership because that's the only way you get committee positions, committee seats. And the, when you get committee seats, that's when you really shape policy. So you have to be nice to get on the committee to then shape policy to then get your your goals reached. And so 
I was just naive as an outsider. I didn't know enough about how Washington worked. So I got there, I learned about how Washington worked, and I tried to exploit it to the benefit of the working people, even though sometimes the outsiders, it looks like we're just not fighting, right? Like, oh, we fight silently. I think that's something AOC said recently. It's like, you know, we negotiate behind closed doors. And so that's the charitable case, okay? The uncharitable case is um, they got elected being these swashbuckling outsiders, but then they got there and they like the power, they like the prestige, they like the the title, right? Congress people. And they sort of got lost and, and sold out and were willing to play the game and willing to take whatever tiny crumbs were given because, hey, good enough. Because first and foremost, they might care about themselves over the movement that got them in there in the first place. So there's the charitable case, there's the uncharitable case, and you can determine which one you think is true or if it's, you know, kind of something in the middle between the two of them, okay? But what is undeniable is that they did not do the Tea Party tactics. Because there was a huge fight over this thing called force the vote. And the whole idea with force the vote was, hey, we want you, a block of lefties, to block Nancy Pelosi from becoming Speaker of the House and demand extractions. Because this game of, like, we'll go along to get along and play from the inside, look... At first, if you bring that idea up, it's like, okay, give it a shot. But then we they've tried it for decades, and it never worked. It never worked. So I don't know why you keep doing the same thing when you know it is going to fail unless you don't care that it fails, right? And so the idea was, hey, vote as a block, extract concessions, and then that's how you get victories. Now, there was debate over what should the concession be. I thought asking for Medicare for all, even though that we didn't have the votes, but asking for a vote on Medicare for all in the middle of a pandemic, I thought was a great idea because maybe you can get more people interested in it, shift the Overton window, uh, highlight the fact that there's a pandemic and all these people are dying. And if we had universal health care, 330,000 people's lives could be saved. And that's not Kyle speaking. That was a detailed study that came out that said that. Um, and remember, in previous fights, for example, women's suffrage failed a number of times before it passed. A failing vote is not necessarily a death knell for a movement. So I thought that was a fair ask. Some people disagreed and said, no, Medicare for All is not the best ask because we're so far away from it. Let's ask for something else, whatever it may be, $15 minimum wage, whatever. But they didn't ask for anything. They didn't ask for anything. So that was the frustration of the left. And this idea that the Tea Party or this new Freedom Caucus faction was like learning from them. No, clearly they, they didn't learn from them at all. Unless what you're saying is they learned to do the opposite of what they did. Then maybe, yes. And then look, the, the final point I'll make is this. Um, it's not a guarantee that this is going to work either, right? Because, and this is a point I've made in the context of the Republicans. And this applies as well to, let's say in a world that made sense, you did have a left flank of Democrats that fought Pelosi. Um, I think the reason why people were in favor of that was not only because we think it's the best strategy and it could work, but also even if it doesn't work, at least we know you're trying, you know what I mean? At least, and then at least we know like, Hey, you're there for us and with us and like we support you and whatnot. Um, but with this Gates faction, yeah, like first of all, the things they were asking for are not actually good. <laughs> They're asking for bad things like, you know, fucking deficit reduction stuff and border stuff and let's not raise taxes on the rich type stuff. So the, the ass are bad. But also, it will be interesting to see how this unfolds, right? Because it's always possible that, no, Gates and Boebert and the rest of them, they made a lot of enemies in this process. And since they made a lot of enemies, we live in a Machiavellian political world here, and people are going to turn around and stab them in the back. And so eventually, the chickens will come home to roost because they played such hardball. That's possible too, right? Like, we all need to be humble enough to acknowledge when we don't know what's going to happen. And I'm the first to admit, like, I don't know what's going to happen in the future. It's very possible that these extractions actually worked and that they they end up getting a lot of the things that they were calling for, which, by the way, would be bad in their case because, again, the things they're asking for are stupid. Um, it's possible it works, but it's also possible it don't work at all and it backfires massively. So we have to wait and see. But again, for the for the for what we wanted to be, the left Tea Party, um, even if that strategy that we were calling for didn't work, at least we would know, like, hey, you're trying. <laughs> and we respect that, and we like that. And now you'll have people still willing to donate to you, still willing to support you and vote for you. And unfortunately, all the goodwill was sort of destroyed because there was, like, zero effort, you know? It was just like, we'll play the inside game. And uh, how'd that go? Really, to the extent we got anything half decent under the Biden administration, it was all literally because it was supported by Biden, Schumer, Pelosi. 
And I'm not like others who say, like, they, they've done nothing good ever. No, I think that's stupid. I think, of course, they've done good things. The, the fact that, you know, Biden pulled out of Afghanistan, you got to give him credit. He messed it all up because he decided to steal their money from them, which is in turn destroying the country in a different way. But I love that the boots are off the ground out of there. I mean, that's we were all calling for that. And he finally did it. And everybody abandoned him over that. That was crazy to me. No, it was good. He pulled out of Afghanistan. It's good. He did the student loan debt reduction, which he did through executive order. It's good. That in the IRA, we got a 15 percent corporate minimum tax rate, which is a huge deal. There's so many corporations that pay zero in federal taxes. Biden did change that. There's a number of things that we could point to L lowering prescription drug prices for seniors. If it wasn't for Kirsten Cinema, we would have been able to lower it for all Americans. She was the one senator who was blocking it and only gave us, OK, only for seniors, right? Like, we can point to half decent things made in America for green technology and billions of dollars of in investment in that. So I'm willing to give credit where credit is due, but keep it real. The only reason we got anything at all, we got these half measures, which is more than I expected. I expected nothing at all ever, but we got some half measures. The reason we did is because Biden actually supported it. Now imagine what could have been different if it wasn't just that it was also crusaders to his left, pulling him further left and pulling Pelosi further left and forcing them to do certain things. I think we'd be in a better situation. But anyway, this woman has no idea what she's talking about. The, the left, the left flank did Dickie McGee's acts, And that was the problem. The right flank is doing what the old school Tea Party did. So if anything, I think they learned more from them than they did from anybody on the left. Ever since Adpocalypse, when YouTube defunded all independent news and politics overnight, we haven't trusted them. We know they can pull the rug out from underneath us at any time. If you enjoy this content, please consider tipping a dollar or two per month on the Secular Talk Patreon. Link in the video description box below. Thanks for your support.